Thank you so much. I must say, I'm completely honored to be next to some accomp so accomplished uh, professionals. And I am as eager as everyone in the audience to learn about your journeys and hear your stories. So we will do brief introductions. And then I have some questions that I'd like to ask and then we'll open it up uh, for Q&A. So I'm gonna start with Judith Olson. Judith is a CU Boulder alum. After earning her MS and PhD from CU Boulder, she went on to work for NIST. While at NIST, she was recruited to Cold Quanta to spearhead the Atomic Clock Division, where she is today. She is the head of the Atomic Clock Division and a senior physicist. In 2021, she was named Next Generation Leader of the Year at the Women in IT Awards. And she was also recognized for her mentorship and paving the way for other women in the field by being recognized by the Quantum Insider on their 52 Wonder Women Working in Industry as Quantum Scientists and Engineers list. Anna Maria Ray. Anna Maria is a fellow of both Jilla and NIST and is a physicist working on quantum systems and their applications. A few highlights. She was the first Hispanic woman to win the Blatnovic Award for Young Scientist in 2019. And she also won the MacArthur Fellowship in 2013. Then we have Star Fassler. Star is a photonics research engineer at Vescent. She received her bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from CU Boulder. Star has always been passionate about making a positive impact in the world around her. She is also leading the environmental testing of the next generation optical clockwork technology for deployed quantum timing systems. Then we have Sarah Campbell. Sarah is a senior advanced physicist <laughs> at Quantinium. This was after getting her BS from MIT, her master's from UC Berkeley, and her PhD in physics from CU Boulder. She currently works on the next level of quantum computers, allowing her to fully enjoy her love of physics, specifically quantum physics. Then we have Johanna Zoltak. Johanna is a senior scientist at Maybell Quantum Industries. She works on state-of-the-art equipment for quantum computers. Her education includes both a bachelor's and a master's degree from EPFL in Switzerland, as well as a PhD in nanotechnology from the Technical University of Denmark and a postdoctoral research position at the University of Manchester. Her current position lets her continue to explore her passions in quantum technology. And that is our, that's the lineup of our panelists. And I am so excited to get started. So without further ado, I'm going to ask you each to please describe your current role and a brief description of your journey into the field of quantum. I know this is a this is a big question here. Um, Judith, do you want to start? Hi, I'm Judith. Um, I am currently leading our atomic clocks research group over at Cold Quanta, just up by the Belmont Dog Park over there. Um, and so my my general mm -hmm. job day to day is a lot of coordinating with different people, proposal writing, finding good ways to collaborate, and how to really push on this technology further to make it fieldable. It's kind of a, the, the big push we have right now is making these systems that work really well in labs work really well outside of the lab as well. Sorry, was there more to your question? <laughs> That's okay. You could, you could toss it. It was about your journey. And can you describe a little bit how you got to this position? Yeah. Um, so I started looking for you know potential job opportunities as soon as I graduated, well, slightly before I graduated, um, and wound up postdoc at NIST and kind of had a, a moment of realization that I, I wanted more opportunity for growth and leadership and to, I, I was at that point, I was basically maintaining the time scale. It was a lot of like plumbing work on mazers and like a lot of box checking. And I, I wanted to do something that was more challenging and, and had more growth opportunities. And Cold Quanta was just starting up their clock program. So I joined that. Um, and within a few months, they promoted me to lead the whole program. That's fantastic. Yeah. Who would like to jump in here next? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Well, I am Ana Maria Rey. I'm originally from Colombia. Um, I'm atomic molecular and optical physics theorist. Um, I am a NIS fellow, a GILA fellow, and, and I am a joint professor at the um, uh, physics department at the University of Colorado, Boulder. Um, why, what we do, and that's very fun, is that we try to understand how we use light to manipulate atoms and to use these atom-light interactions and the atoms itself for things that are useful. So we want to do them for generating 
uh, standards on petrology, so atomic clocks, but we want to use them also for quantum simulation. We want to use these systems to answer questions that we don't understand about solid state systems or high energy physics. And of course, they also, in principle, we can use this system for building a quantum computer. Um, yes, so I, uh, most of my time I do research, but I also uh, teach classes at, at the uh, physics department. Um, now my journey, mm -hmm. uh, I'm originally from Colombia. According to my dad, I was telling him that I wanted to be an atomic physicist. I don't know why he <laughs> said that, but, uh, yeah, but that's what he said. I don't remember myself doing that, but uh, I love physics when I was very young and uh, I decided to pursue the physics, even though my parents were opposed to that, because in Colombia being a physicist meant you were going to drive a taxi after that. That's what my parents said. <laughs> so but I'm very stubborn, so I didn't care, and, and I did physics. I am. Then after that, of course, in Colombia, there was not too many opportunities to continue physics, so I came and did my PhD at the University of Maryland uh, at College Park, and there... The, the person that changed completely my mind was Bill Phillips. He was uh, he got the Nobel Prize for cooling atoms um, with lasers. And since then, I wanted to do quantum physics and cool, cool atoms. Um, so I did my PhD um, at uh, University of Maryland. Then I did a postdoc at, um, at Harvard, at ITAM, um, an Institute of Theoretical Atomic and Molecular Physics. And then I came here at GILA, where I um, have a lot of fun mm -hmm. understanding atoms and light. I'd also just like to add that Ana Maria's AMO class is, is a big part of why I wound up where I, I am now and learned a lot from her on that. Uh, hi, Joanna. Um, so I started wanting to study physics in France where I grew up and decided to go to the best French speaking university I could find in Europe. So I went to Switzerland to study physics um, and there I discovered solid state physics. Uh, so I went on and did a PhD in solid state physics and semiconductor physics, which leads to a lot of uh, questions about how things work and how, how to go further. I went on to do a postdoc in a great lab looking at 2D semiconductors, so as small as you can get them and how they interact with light and how they interact, how electrons interact with them and um, how all these this small phenomena happen. And during my postdoc, I realized that this is starting to get really, really far from the real world mm -hmm. and applications <laughs> and that I wanted to go and get out of academia and see what people use these technologies for, because even in the past, like all the big things in science and technology, when they become really big is when they get out of the lab and have an impact on the world and on the technology we're using. And so I left academia and uh, started looking for possibilities outside where, where like technologies are making an impact today. And that's when I started working for Mabel Quantum and trying to um, make a difference for uh, quantum computing and trying to bring new new developments in the um, to the quantum computing community, and hopefully that's what I'm going to keep doing in the future. Um, so, hello, <laughs> hello, I'm Star Fassler. Um, as Brittany mentioned, I um, graduated from CU Boulder less than a year ago. I took definitely a different route than these women here. Um, I went into mechanical engineering and really didn't find my passion for optics until about junior year um, when I did an internship with a company called Sporian Microsystems. And there they introduced me to Raman spectroscopy and hyperspectral imaging. And I thought it was so incredibly fascinating. And I was also fortunate for my senior projects. Um, I worked with NOAA Chemical Sciences Laboratory to help them develop a miniature airborne cavity enhanced spectrometer capable of detecting NO2 levels on a UAV. So that kind of solidified my passion for optics and I knew my next steps had to be taking this route. And especially as a you know, mechanical engineer, it is so broad, you can generally go into anything. Um, and so I was fortunate to find Vescent uh, actually through my internship. And at Vescent, I work as a photonics research engineer. And um, what I'm mainly focusing on is um, leading the environmental testing on the next generation of optical clockwork technology. 
So kind of like Judith mentioned, kind of turning everything that's in a lab and making it deployable so that we can actually use it in the field. Hi, um, uh, yeah, my name is Sarah Campbell. I um, am a physicist on the commercial systems team at Continuum down the road in Broomfield. So um, basically I just get to take like the latest, greatest uh, sort of technologies that the other teams have developed, you know, like in terms of, you know, the electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, optical engineers, um, and I get to integrate all those things and make like, you know, the next best uh, quantum computer. And so that's really fun. Um, and yeah, you know, and then we get to like debug things and like play with atoms with lasers. That's what we all want to do all the time anyway, right? Um, so yeah, my journey, um, let's see, I was really into math um, through at least undergrad. And I think, um, I don't know, I was like gonna be a mathematician or something until, um, yeah, I started working in labs and like people taught me how to solder and I thought that was really cool. You could actually make things that do things. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I came here for my PhD. Uh, I worked in June Yee's lab on optical frequency atomic clocks. Um, you know, that was fun. And like, yeah, it used to be, I think like back in the day, you know, there weren't all these quantum computing companies. And so if you wanted to keep on shooting lasers at atoms, you probably had to stay in like academia. Um, so I did a postdoc and like, I liked it, but then like, you know, or, yeah, over time, I think it was becoming clear that like, oh, I could just, you know, not have to worry about funding or proposals or whatever, and just like play in the lab all day if I um, switched to industry. So um, yeah, I've been doing that for the past couple of years. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, so you just brought up a, a, one of my questions, a great topic is, you know, there weren't always all these quantum computing or technology companies. So where do you all think the future of quantum is going? There's a lot of news and activity about quantum computers and platforms, um, which specifically Sarah and Anna Marie, you focus on. So um, curious your thoughts. Yeah, I guess I'm holding the mic. So, yeah, um, go for I think it. <laughs> the, the longer I work in the field, the more and more likely I think um, it all is to be like a big game changer and actually work out in like a meaningful way that people would, you know, like to use it um, to be able to do something they wouldn't be able to compute otherwise. Like, yeah, as, as like obviously what 10, 20 years ago when I first started um, doing this stuff, like, no way, right? It was always like a joke, but. I think, yeah, lately, as time goes on, I'm more and more, you know, convinced. And obviously, that's where I'm working right now. But yeah. Anna Marie, do you have any thoughts to add to that? Great. So um, I think, um, because also I'm from Nice, so I think the best outcome of quantum technology is going to be on the area of quantum metrology first. So if, if you guys need to to bet where is where we are going to make a big impact is in metrology. Um, so that's very exciting. There is a lot of progress that is happening in the last couple of years. And I really think that we are going to make it work soon. For other technologies, quantum computing, it might take a little bit longer. So I'm, I'm not an expert also. So, um, but I think even if we, we are able to use technologies for metrology, this can impact many directions. Um, because, I mean, atomic clocks are used everywhere. I mean, from GPS for everything. So, so that's where I think, uh, at the least in the next couple of years, that's where quantum mechanics, um, quantum technology will, will, we will win from them. Thank you. Anyone want to add anything else? I'm just really glad you said that while people from my company are here to <laughs> <laughs> appreciate that. <laughs> Coldquanta.com. <laughs> um, okay. Now let's talk about. Does anyone, you, want to, you want to add something? Um, Please. Sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you have the mic, go for it. No, no I have to, right? <laughs> um, um, no, I, I really like your, your answer because not only the optics side, but also on the solid state physics side over the past few years, there's been a huge breakthrough from metrology with quantum Hall effect and a lot of characterization. So it's quantum, but just not just the optics side. I know mm -hmm. most of this table is really <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on the optics uh, side, but mm -hmm. quantum is having a huge impact on, at all levels. Um, on, on metrology, definitely. Um, 
just like, you know, a common theme, we are going to hear this a lot today about making things deployable. You know, everything we, we, we've grown so much because we have been able to bring things out of the lab and into the field. And one of the biggest things like I'm leading is the environmental testing. So it's the fact that not only do we bring this out into the field, but it can withstand harsh environments such as vibration, such as extreme, both hot and cold temperatures. Uh, so just wanted to add that. Thank you. So, I mean, I think everyone can feel the passion from all of you. Um, and what I'd love to know is what do you each find most interesting about quantum or what got you interested, whether it's the technology, the science itself, the future? I um, would love to hear your thoughts. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, in mechanical engineering, you take two general physics courses and then you have to take a third. Uh, the third one I did was actually quantum mechanics. And, you know, they teach you about lasers and what a laser is and the acronym for a laser. Didn't know it was an acronym at first, mm -hmm. but um, you start to realize, okay, what can these be used for? And I think I got so interested in actually lasers specifically because of the vast applications. Um, like we talked about before, laser cooling. Um, what I'm specifically working on is actually the next generation of optical clocks kind of what we brought up here. Um, the idea when I worked with Raman spectroscopy, the idea that light can help determine the chemical compound of something, I thought that was so fascinating. And um, I think also the idea that this is new and novel research and technology, and we get to be a part of something that is so, you know, groundbreaking and can help, you know, in the future with a lot of things. Yeah, different take. Okay. <laughs> Part of what drew me into quantum and to stay in this field was just how obnoxiously difficult it can be and how you constantly, like, in doing metrology clocks, trying to just measure things better, you're always running into some new problem. And it doesn't matter how well you've prepared until you actually go and do this thing and try to measure something. It's very hard to really predict what will happen. And so... One of my favorite things is just that you can push on these problems and, and by the time you realize what the problem was, you realize you asked the wrong question. And I kind of like that process of discovery that it really is this iterative process where you use theory and then you have to go and try things and see how closely it matches to theory and, and kind of the back and forth of that and that the constant new barriers you run into are fun for me. They're, they're new challenges to figure out like how do we get past intermodulation noise or, or, or whatever noise source is bothering our clocks. I think quantum mechanics is so cool. I mean, it's it's the best. So, I mean, the fact that you can understand how the microscopic world behave that is not classical. I mean, you are used to everyday life and kind of you have some intuition, but when they teach you that you can have a particle in a superposition, you start to think, how is that? I mean, I'm trying to explain quantum mechanics to my son and he's fascinated. I mean, he doesn't understand things, but he's asking questions <laughs> all the time. So I, I think this idea that is something that is beyond what uh, typically we have in the real world is fascinating. But in addition, it's a challenge. I mean, because we cannot solve quantum. It's the first time that we say not even a supercomputer can solve a problem. Mm -hmm. That's that's amazing that it's so difficult. And nevertheless, we are trying to make it work and it will work at some point that we can try to master what is the quantum work and use it for something useful. Anyone else want to add? Yeah, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I think I um, am always really interested in pushing the limits of things, like whether it's with the atomic clock, like trying to push its um, performance limits. And I, I mean, I think metrology is so cool because like, you know, the better you make your clock or, or what have you, like the more of it, the universe you can like actually look at. Um, and I think similarly uh, with the quantum computer it's just like the you know the num number of dimensions of like uh performance specs like you know increases but i think i think it's pretty similar and i, I personally just like very interested in like what's what's the limiting um factor for for this thing's performance and like how um how the hardware is causing that and i think i'm mostly interested yeah in, in that like just personally um and like sort of coming up with engineering solutions to keep uh, pushing the boundaries of, of what's possible. You definitely can't be deterred in this field when things go wrong because they go wrong every day. So, 
Well, that leads me to my next question. Thank you. Um, so we're here because we want to know what does it take, right? Um, so what are some of the important skills needed to either go into quantum research or the industry? I mean, we, we heard a lot of grit, um, be curious, but would love to hear what else, what other skill sets and what other recommendations you would give um, in terms of advice or those interested in getting into the field? Okay, so I went first. <laughs> I, I can go. Um, I think already from like the composition of this panel, we can see that there's a very diverse set of backgrounds um, that are just representing among the five of us. And that's pretty true to what quantum technology is. Um, the company I work with, Mabel Quantum, um, I'm a physicist by training, but most of the team is mechanical engineer. We have electrical engineers. Um, a lot of my work is um, some chemistry. So if I had had a background in chemistry, that would have been very appropriate. Um, photonic science are very relevant, but semiconducting technology are also extremely relevant for the um, solid state um, side of quantum computing. So there's, there's really um, a huge pool of skills that are needed and a huge number of backgrounds and as diverse um, the background is as much we can do basically because everybody brings their own knowledge and their own experience and then we can all build together like the new the new quantum field basically um, and it's not just the knowledge of quantum but it's also how we build a computer and how we integrate it and how we can put it in a room and how like everything works together how we run software on it how we everything works together and um, I think I think it's if you want to go into quantum because that's what you want to do, probably the easiest route is to do physics and know about quantum. But if that's not your background, there's still a place for you in quantum. Um, so I think in addition to grit, it's also important that you know when to stop trying to do something. Um, like if you set a goal and you decide like, I am going to get like this performance from my system or whatever and decide you're going to work on it, like you could work on that till you die. Like there's, there's no reason for you to necessarily get a positive outcome. And so some of the hardest things to do are to step back and say like, is it worth my time to keep pushing on this problem or is there a different route? Um, and and to realize that it's it's not giving up, it's it's strategically using your own resources. Um, but that that was hard for me to come around to at first. I definitely was bashing my head into walls for a while there in grad school trying to solve problems, <laughs> metaphorically bashing. <laughs> yes, for me, uh, although this is common in anything, I think if you want to be successful, you have to work hard, work hard, because that's the key for for doing. I mean, work hard and like what you do. I mean, because if you are going to work hard and you don't know, you, you don't, you dislike what you are doing, is that problem. So work hard. And that's always I tell my students, this is the key for success. Um, I think uh, the other point that has been very useful for me, and I saw in other fields, but I was mentioned also in quantum, learn to collaborate with others. I mean, mm. this field is so broad, so difficult that you're not going to do it by yourself. So key has been always be open to collaborations and not only in your field i mean quantum is targeting high energy so it's interesting that when now we now to know you know high energy we need to know general relativity so it, it's broad so collaborate with as many people you can and and this always is beneficial for for you Um, I just wanted to mention also too, um, and we kind of talked about it here, but really that cross-discipline training. Um, a lot of optics companies are small companies, and so they want to hire someone that they know isn't going to just wear one hat at the company. They can wear many different hats throughout the company. Um, you know, another big thing too, I would say, and in anything is being a forever learner, mm -hmm. being open to the idea that things are constantly changing and we're gaining new knowledge every day. Um, and I think the biggest one is um, great at debugging and troubleshooting. As we all talked about, you know, you have to know when to step away. Um, I work with very tiny fibers and if I'm mad one day, I need to walk away or I'll break, I'll break the entire <laughs> cavity. So need to know that like th this industry takes a lot of debugging and troubleshooting constantly and, um, you know, tapping into the unknown. And so those are things like, you know, they kind of suck, but it's things that we need to, 
you know, get better at and, and, and learn how to kind of be patient with the process. Yeah, I think definitely debugging and, and troubleshooting. And I, I think, uh, like, you know, hopefully by the time you finish your everyone's PhDs, like you, you probably have the, the confidence that you can like figure anything out. You can Google anything, you know, like, I mean, that's definitely a, was a process for me during my PhD. I remember when um, my senior graduate student had to go write his thesis and I like went into his office like, Ben, this thing broke. Like, and he's like, you can fix it. <laughs> like, or whatever. So like, um, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, like we all like sort of develop that. And um, I think the process of like coming up to speed on new things is like, you know, once you've done it a few times, you're you're faster um, than the next time. And finally, I think like, yeah, just being a decent Python programmer might be good for any field. Yeah. <laughs> any other pieces of advice or any any other remarks? I knew it. <laughs> One other tool that has been extremely useful for me and I get told like differentiates me from a lot of other people is that I'm I'm pretty good at networking and talking to people and I wasn't always this way at all. Um, so one tip that I, I've told a few people up here is I when I would go to conferences I used to force myself to do like swag competitions with friends and so like my goal would be like I'm gonna get 20 pens and that means I have to talk to 20 people and have a conversation with them about what I do what they do and how it might overlap and I I legitimately grew up a very shy person and this is where I'm at now. Um, so it's, it's definitely a skill. You have to practice it just like anything else. You have to work hard at it. Um, but the benefits you get in terms of being able to collaborate, work with lots of people, work with diverse teams are, are very, very important, especially if you want to go into industry. Thank you. Um, so we, we gave general words of advice and I thought that was really helpful. Thank you. Um, I'd like to get a little more specific on how we can encourage more women to get into the field. So changing gears a little bit, would love to hear some of your thoughts on that panels like this let's do it <laughs> well i can say that for me role models are a big game changer so i had the fortune to for example met debbie jean eh, when she was alive and for me looking at her seeing what she do she had a family she was fantastic in, in research and um, he was a nice friend so for me this inspired me completely so the problem is that we don't have too many women at the moment, but I think the more we are and the more we are able to spy orders and show them it's not impossible. I mean, you can have a family, you can work, you can do all of these things. It's what we need. Um, so positive thinking also. I mean, sometimes people take the road, oh, no, being a woman is, is not good. I, I think that's not the way to approach the problem. I mean, of course there are issues, but I think what we have to enhance is the advantage of being a woman to, I mean, there are, there are great things that you can do um, and, and just trying to inspire others and show them that, that there is a way, there is a path and can be very successful. Um, just to say the obvious things like maternity leave, um, mm -hmm. reasonable sick leave policies at companies and having enough flexibility, like every everyone, regardless of gender, likes having a life for the most part, otherwise you wouldn't still be here. And, and so respecting that and allowing people to kind of be their authentic selves and take joy and pleasure out of their life is is big. And also having like culture that is accepting of people who, who act differently, you know, you can be really introverted or very extroverted and like everything in between, and it's all fine. Um, and especially like in physics, it's really important that people who come from very different backgrounds and things can work together and collaborate. Just making sure you have the environment. Um, I, I think panels like this are definitely a big thing. Um, I think there's a lot to do also at the younger age because we are seeing very few women now applying for jobs, but I think it's mostly an image of very few women going into physics uh, originally, and that's something that can be changed earlier. So I think there's a lot of effort to be done at the high school level, at mm -hmm. the middle school level, where people are choosing what they want to do and maybe seeing more um, women coming and talking at this level might make a difference already early on. Um, say, saying that maybe companies also can have a role to play in this by organizing events and maybe sponsoring events um, for younger, younger women too. Um, and, but I think it's already getting better to some extent. Like when I was studying, there was no women professors in the department where I studied. 
Um, and I think the numbers have risen quite a lot. I mean, to such an extent that there's quite a few around. Um, so, so it's definitely improving. It's getting better. There's still a lot to do. <laughs> Um, just to bounce off of what you said, kind of companies can get more involved. And, you know, with anything in life, having a goal, you, it's something that's attainable. You can work towards it. It's a clear path to get there. And um, maybe if these companies incorporated, you know, maybe having by a certain time, having um, the company be 50% women, 20, whatever it may be, just having some sort of goal, um, going along, highlighting more women accomplishments, you know. Um, you heard about all these women today. They're so incredible, so intelligent, and have achieved so much in life, and that needs to be recognized. It, you know, um, starting young, like you said, being mentors to young women um, and just kind of showing them that this is a path that you can take and letting them know that it is doable no matter what you go into and what you're interested in. Yeah, I think I, I really agree with um, a few things people were mentioning earlier, especially um, about, yeah, if we want more women sort of like in our uh, sort of technical roles, we probably, probably should, yeah, should start like college or earlier. Um, and I was kind of thinking like maybe, you know, maybe maybe if you don't have like the audacity to like apply for an internship, even though you're like a freshman, I wonder if like women more like proportionally maybe like, um, think like, oh, I'm just a freshman. I don't know any physics. Like, I could never do an internship in physics or like an, a research position in physics because that's definitely how I felt. You know, as a freshman, I'd be like, oh, I haven't even taken any major specific classes yet or whatever. So I wonder if we could like do a better job of like reaching out and like just like specifically saying like you don't actually need any special skills to start getting involved. Um, and that in combination, I think with like more are used and especially like like I had a great time in undergrad that's when I really got into the lab but I went to a large research in institution so I think like if we can reach out with our, our use um you know to smaller programs where there aren't necessarily a lot of grad students in your field you can just like talk to you about applying to grad school and like what it's like to be in the lab um I think like for yeah for experimental physics it seems like uh pretty pretty important to get into doing lab work when you're in undergrad and I think some people might just like yeah not get the memo about that so thank you um so can you each talk a little bit about what you've done to make your work place more inclusive I know we talked high level about some ideas but would love to hear what you guys have done Stars shaking her head. Right, so I'll go. Right. Um, oh, okay. I don't know. I, I invite people to come and drink wine in my backyard. Yeah. I don't know. Like, um, <laughs> yeah, my team's like half women, but yeah. Team bonding. That's what I hear. Um, so Vescent actually re recently started a lunch and learn for everyone in the company. Um, they provide lunch. And then um, like our CEO the other day uh, gave us a talk about the history of Vescent and our D2 product line. Um, and so that was really exciting to bring in production, the administrative side, the engineering, the R&D team, all into one location and kind of um, get everyone involved on the history of our company, but also where it's leading to. Um, so I think things like that. I know when I first started, um, three of my coworkers would come stop by my office for either tea time or espresso shot time. Um, so doing little things like that, um, I would say, adds to the inclusivity. Um, I I'm going to say something that will sound really silly, but to some extent, just being there is already making a difference, I believe. Um, because just being there, part of the conversation during the decision processes, being like part of the, of the um, recruitment process and looking at um, the different profiles and trying to mitigate maybe some internal bias that could be there that might not show up. And just having a different experience from the remaining of the crowd. I'm in a company where most people are men. I'm the only uh, women around. So it, it does bring a different view and a different perspective. And I think it's important to just be able to, like, it, in the group I'm in, we are a small, small team, and it's really easy to stand up and speak up and maybe give a different opinion. 
um, when things are happening. Um, and I think that's, that's an important thing, like that it's always, people will always have some internal bias, especially in these environments that are very heavily homogeneous. Mm -hmm. And um, just being a diversity and bringing a diverse opinion is already making a difference. Um, I, I'd say I, I try to advocate for people who are not necessarily getting the opportunity to have their full say in conversations. And like, they, they tend to be more women who get talked over and things, but just stopping to like, go back to their point and be like, I think, you know, this person was trying to say something here and giving them the space to like, make their own mistakes and, you know, make their own successes, giving them that chance. Um, one other thing I know that we try to do in hiring is, is to not look so critically necessary at the nitty gritty of the details and how well someone is selling themselves and kind of give them a chance to sell themselves to you instead in person and talk to them and, you know, give them that interview, even if they don't necessarily on paper look like the strongest candidate. And so we found some really, really talented people that way because, you know, maybe they didn't have the skills to sell themselves well and they were shy or interviewed or whatever, but you, you put them in the right environment and they get a chance to shine. Yes, I'm a big advocate that the way that we can change things are is starting at early stages. So what I do is try to do things for students, for young students. So, for example, I try to give one every year a lecture to high school students. Um, I try to accept as much as I can conference. I'm from Colombia, so conference from Hispanic countries and um, they invite me often and if I'm even if I'm busy I try to get gave priority to give priority to those invitations. I also for example like to write things for for young kids so I wrote that chapter in um, something that is book for rebel rebel girls so I write I wrote my biography in funny terms so so they could read that. So yes for me diversity comes at a very early stage. And that's what is my target. I mean, I try to focus my effort there. You're so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted to bounce on something you said. Um, something we've been trying to do is change the way we formulate job descriptions when we mm -hmm. write them. And something statistic has shown is that women will apply only if they fill every single requirement of the job description. And men will apply if they still like feel one, maybe. Um, and maybe when we write a job description and you feel like some of it is relevant, apply. Because we wrote this job description with something in mind, but maybe your profile will fit exactly something else, which we didn't write right now, but we need in a few months, or we need, but we didn't think about it that way or phrased it differently. So if you have, even if you don't feel like this is exactly you, still apply. It might still be relevant and you'll be a great fit. And it's worth just trying because you might, you might just be that candidate we need and we just didn't phrase it the way we wanted. What you just said was huge because that's exactly how it worked out for me at Vescent. Um, the job description, yes, I had a little bit of the optics background with my internship and my senior projects, but I was coming into a um, um, mostly dominate, physics dominated um, company as a mechanical engineer. Um, and I saw it did not deter me at all what was on the job description, luckily. <laughs> and I, uh, I did go in for that interview and everything fell into place. And like you said about kind of right time, right place, it just so happened um, that they were awarded this contract and they needed a test engineer. And it, and it worked out that I kind of fit, checked off all those boxes. So exactly what you said. Do not be deterred if you don't fit everything on that job description. It is very general. And you know what? Maybe companies can do a better job about generalizing it a little bit more to fit kind of everyone and not deter people who don't fit into the exact things that they say. Yeah, 100%. I think um, if you don't fit all the you know things are like if, if you're not a great fit for the position but you're great like your your, your application is just going to get like transferred to another manager so like you know <laughs> don't get don't be shy at all um i would say and in fact i thought of a better answer than just getting drunk in my backyard um so yeah i think <laughs> i think um uh you know 
I like struggle with a number of things, including like really bad ADHD. And so I think like I'm pretty transparent about and like pretty vulnerable about my own experience. And I think that makes me like pretty approachable. I'm never going to be like a smooth, cool talker that could intimidate like a younger employee or whatever. Um, and so I think like a lot of people do come to me um, just I think because I'm approachable and pretty honest about my own stuff. And I think I'm pretty good also at like not being shy about just like, you know, bringing that, um, you know, whatever people's issues or complaints are or whatever, like, you know, right to the top and like kind of holding them accountable for that too. And I, I've seen like, you know, just like amazing changes in responses in the past like few months. So, yeah. Thank you all for taking action. That is all that I hear. And that's fantastic. Um, so, Johanna, you had mentioned that you have seen progress and you think that there has been changes in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion in the, in the industry. I'd love to hear more thoughts on that. How do you see the progress or can you extrapolate on that? And then others, please feel free to jump in. To, to some extent, it's what I've seen in academia, which is a bit blurred by the fact that I've moved across different countries that do have different statistics. Mm -hmm. So it might be um, like erasing some of the some of the variations at a like more global level. But it, it does seem like there are now women in physics at a higher level that um, more women go on to become professors and. Um, maybe fewer stop after PhD. Um, at least it's it's an impression. Like where I, I studied with no women at the professor level when I went to do my postdoc, suddenly there were some. Um, I'm not going to say there were 50 percent. <laughs> that's not true. Mm -hmm. But there were some. And that's already, I think, a good improvement. And these groups did tend to bring more women PhD students and more women postdoc as well. So I think this, going back to the role model, um, explanation from earlier I think having women brings more women and that's that's really like a driving uh, factor um, at the industry level well I left my postdoc a year ago so <laughs> I've been in in the company a year I joined I was the one woman and now we have another intern in the company so we, there's two of us Maritza is at the back here um, so, so there is, there is definitely an improvement. Maritza did something great, actually. Um, Maritza is an electrical engineer and she reached out spontaneously to us. There was no electrical engineer advertisement oh, online yeah. and, um, we definitely needed someone with her skills. So she's now staying with us for, for the upcoming few months and helping us with the electrical engineering. Yeah. So please do that. <laughs> if, you, if you see some companies you're interested in, definitely go. If you're interested also in drinking with people, there's a, <laughs> there's a happy hour after at the yeah, thing. So please exactly. join and come talk to us. Um, yeah. Anna Maria, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the advancements you've seen in the industry. Well, in industry, I'm not too familiar, but I can tell academia. you in academic, yep. in academia. So I think the, the physics department, it's clear how the physics departments around the world are trying to make a big effort to increase the number of women that they are hiring. So when we do, I'm part of the graduate committee and very on purpose to the, I mean, with very, I mean, we design that assistance such that we in purpose have to look at the women folders and make sure that they are red. Yes, that we are not going to be. So the awareness that in, represented minorities and women my, if the GRE even is a little bit slower, is lower, don't, I mean, use the GRE just as a general cutoff, but don't, I mean, try to be careful how you evaluate uh, the different folders. So make sure that you read them and then you're not missing something important. Same for, for when you write um, an advertisement for a position, make sure that there is an inclusive statement that you say, please, if apply, I mean, we are interested in diversity environment. So I think the idea of diversity has been very important, not only in universities, but in funding companies. NSF, for example, uh, lately he's trying to, they, you, we have a grant from NSF that is the PFC, and they said, well, okay, we want to use the PFC to promote other universities that has less opportunities and a lot of minorities. So why don't you team up with another university, write a grant, and see if we can fund this, um, this other university. So, uh, Diversity has been a very, very important priority at the federal level too. So with funding and also, I mean, in many situations when you write a grant and and 
they, they care about their risk activities. It's really important uh, for NSF, for example, it's really important to a risk component targets diversity. So I think that's how I see a lot of progress and it's working slowly. I mean, it's, it would be great <laughs> if it's faster, but, but there is, at least there is an effort for doing that. Judith, do you want to talk a little bit, you've spent time in academia and industry on some of the advancements you've seen? I, I think people are generally much more accepting these days. Like I, I remember back like in elementary school, anytime somebody heard I wanted to like go into science or physics being like, literally I had a teacher go, but you're a girl when I told them that at one point. And I've, maybe it's just, I'm project more of like a confidence where people don't feel comfortable saying that to me anymore or something, but I, I definitely experienced that. She got a, a little less. taller. <laughs> um, I, I think there's still a long way to go in terms of acceptance of, of people of that, that don't necessarily look like everyone else at the company kind of a thing. And, and like, I, I've heard people complain about like women with tattoos that they didn't want to hire, but they hired men with tattoos kind of things. And it's just, everyone should be accepted. It doesn't matter what you look like or what gender you are. Um, you're there to do science. And if you can contribute meaningfully that way, it really shouldn't matter if like you did your hair the way they expected you to. Um, and I think that's definitely the direction we are pushing in. And, and I've, I've been seeing a lot more inclusivity. Anyone else? Yeah, sure. I think, yeah, I definitely agree. Like from elementary, middle school till to now, it's it's gotten a lot better. I think he's like, you know, math team or whatever, you know, I'd go up to receive my trophy or whatnot and people would be like, oh, it's a girl. Like, which is like, that's like so strange to even think that that's like, you know, a thing that people would say. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like a lot of us who um, went through Jilla maybe had the benefit of like, you know, for my whole PhD, we had like, you know, four or five like super badass like female professors. So like that was just like normal ever, like for my whole PhD, which I think like, you know, um, it's only like recent generations, I would say that's like that. And like now I don't even feel one bit out of place. Like, yeah, my team was like more than half women, which is also crazy. Um, you know, I'd never even like worked under um, a female scientist before, but my project lead um, was just like, yeah, super baller. Um, and like, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just gotten so much better for sure. Thanks to, you know, all y'all at Jilla. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so a few more questions, then we'll leave ample time for Q&A. Um, what sorts of things have not yet been discussed when it comes to including more women in this field? Dara's shaking her head. Yeah. So I'm only 23 years old. I, you know, things like pregnancy and motherhood um, and menopause, I'm not quite there yet. Um, but it is something I do need to think about. Um, you know, and I, I think it's important that when you go in for your initial interviews, these are the things that you ask about kind of what is the culture, what does the company offer? Um, you know, Vescent, one of the things that drew me to Vescent was right off the bat, when you sign, you get four weeks PTO. That is, I, I don't hear that very often in industry. Um, also the, you know, with COVID, we've now kind of moved on to this hybrid schedule. Vescent also offers that, the flexibility um, with your hours um, and things like that. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 okay, I lost my train of thought. What was the question? <laughs> no, you're actually spot on because <laughs> the, the next question, which is dovetailing, says, how can we create a place to discuss issues such as motherhood, pregnancy? Okay. Okay. So I think that so was you're, the question we're on the I same was page. thinking about. Yeah. Yep. yeah, but ultimately, I just think, you know, it, it takes us asking these questions and yes. you know it may be also the company being aware of these things because yeah. you know our company I we don't have very many women at our, women at our company but we are constantly growing mm -hmm. we do have women in the R&D team um, in the engineering team in the production team in the administrative side of things and so as we grow as a company these are things that you know collectively we need to come together and start thinking about and start implementing when we have interviews or maybe job descriptions or things like that What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what 
what are the tra- okay. um, <laughs> what sorts of things have not yet been discussed when it comes to including more women in the field? Yes. So we we're saying motherhood, pregnancy, menopause. What else is, is not discussed That's, enough? It's a pretty comprehensive list. Um, I, I think just to reiterate, like the flexibility is a big thing, like mm-hmm. the ability to leave to make like a doctor's appointment midday and to know that like if something happens and like you can't go to work, you're sick or like you have cramps and they're miserable and you're not going to work that day, that your boss isn't going to be mad at you for that. Like you're you're a human. Everyone gets sick regardless of gender. Like it, it doesn't really matter that that should be something everybody gets to do. If you're sick, you get to take time off and like you have a life. You get you get days off where you don't have to be a slave to the lab. Not that other days you are. I didn't, I didn't mean to like imply anything bad there, but yeah. I, for me, daycare was fundamental. So um, um, from Colombia, my parents could not come here. So it is, but uh, my son went to daycare since he was two months old. So having the possibility to have someone that helped you in these early days is fundamental. So I remember we had a niece director. She was a woman. And she was asking, what do you need? I mean, and, and she said, do you have a good daycare? And she was right on. Yes, daycares are fundamental. The other important part that we are trying to, to do, but uh, it's not very common, is for traveling. I mean, giving co- attending conference is fundamental in, in science. And many times if you have something, if you are alone, so you are a single mom or something, then what you do with your kid. So it's, it's a big, big issue. So, so having um, um, APS or different uh, sponsors, arranging a daycare for, for you when you give a company is fundamental. It's something we are trying to put, push with them up. And, and this is a direction that is still very, uh, not, not, not very well done. So this is an important point that needs to be figured out better. Oh, yeah. If the question was like, yeah, stuff we haven't talked about yet. Um, I would, yeah, I would give some, some advice to the men in the audience. Um, like, you'd be a little more, uh, just, just be like kind of aware if you're like talking over someone at a meeting. Because um, I think, you know, not me, right? I went to like the junior school of argument, but like, <laughs> um, <laughs> But, like, you know, a lot of people, I think, are just conditioned to, like, not have a very aggressive response and kind of just, like, back off really quickly. So if you, like, someone's like, ah, like, like, maybe just, like, go, you can, like, actively, you know, follow up on that, like, let them speak. Um, I also say, like, make sure you credit um, your female colleagues for their ideas. And if you hear, you know, somewhat like that idea coming up or maybe someone's like wrongly attributing it or whatever, like just make, make sure you, yeah, just promote, promote your colleagues. Um, I mean, that's generally, I think that's a general, like, you know, it's like with a lot of things, if, if the environment gets better for like this marginalized group or whatever, it, it actually gets better for, for everybody. And so I, I would say just like, yeah, be really generous um, with, with credit. Uh, I think I have one more, but I forgot, but yeah, I think... Um, I don't know if anyone has anything else. No, I, I think something you, you raised is really, really important, which is th- this event is called Women in Quantum, but it's not just about women. It's about all minority. And that's one place to start. But it's all like gender minority and all other minority and making it more inclusive. The work we, do, we are doing like initially for women, maybe, but is for everyone in the end and just making a more inclusive environment. Thank you. This is so inspiring. Um, so we have about a few minutes left. Would love to open up just for some closing remarks or thoughts, and then we'll have Q and A. Does have Does anyone have any last pieces of guidance about what it takes? Um, I would just say, like, to reiterate, kind of what they're saying too. Like, encourage your your colleagues, especially people who aren't necessarily like feeling like I fit in. This is this is my realm kind of a thing. It's really easy to feel like you don't belong and the difference it can make in your outlook and your ability to stick with it with someone just saying like, hey, you're pretty good at this or you did a good job on this. Or like in undergrad, I had a professor who just suggested I do an REU and like I had never thought I was I didn't think like I had skills to do an REU or anything like that. And just a few words completely changed my trajectory in life. And I I don't think you can possibly overvalue how important it can be just to provide encouragement and and like be nice to people. (laughs) 
Yeah, I think for me, key is believing you. I mean, believe in yourself. You can do it. I mean, if you don't believe that you can do it, well, no one will believe on you. So believe in you and work hard. That has been my key for successful development, for, for a success in a, to have a successful career. Believe in me and do uh, whatever you can do to reach your goals. If you have a goal, you can reach it. You can do it. So that. You can do it. <laughs> Any other closing yeah. remarks? Um, I just want to say, women, we need to stick together. Um, you know, it was interesting, but in engineering, I did have some backlash towards my fellow um, peers, and they happened to be women. And I, I never understood why I, I felt like this was our chance to really grow um, and and be there for one another. Um, Luckily, I have not seen that in industry, um, but I, I think that's just a huge point is we really need to stick together, not just women, but everyone in general. I also think work for a company that makes you live up to your true potential, that pushes you past a certain point. Um, I always make, I, ever since I was a little girl, I always say that I want to live up to my name. My name is Star. And um, I, I feel like Vescent is allowing me to do that. Um, so find those companies that allow you to do that and allow you not just to fit into one realm, one position, but you can go to different areas of the company that you're interested in. Yeah, I think just, just echoing what, what Star said, I think it's really important to find a uh, position where, where you're really engaged because I think, you know, there, if you if you really love what you're doing and you're really engaged, you can, um, you know, you'll be really good at it, I think. And like, I definitely have worked a little bit here or there, like hopped around um, through my science career. And I think what made me like leave usually and go to the next step was like, you know, oh, maybe like, so for some reason, I'm just like not that stoked about like stoked up to work really hard on this. Like, I think like just like find the things that you're really excited to work really hard on and like, you know, everyone will appreciate you for your technical skills. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Okay. I think we here we'll open it up for Q and A. You're good. Okay. <laughs> Oh, yes. Thank you so much. And we gave you a few extra minutes. Yeah, I think um, one thing I, I always try to go around and do is like really admit that um, when I first set foot in a lab or like there are other, like I failed the quantum mechanics midterm as an undergrad, for example, um, I'm doing okay, you know, like, um, like, like just be really honest about like, you know, how much of like everyone's kind of faking it to some degree, right? Like we don't like all know everything or whatever. And I, I think just like being pretty honest about um about all of that, I, like, I, I mean, I don't know exactly what's responsible for all that, but I just feel like, you know, um, yeah, some of it just might, might be, like, a confidence issue. Yeah. So I did not go down the physics path, um, but in terms of retention, I mean, I went through my first freshman, sophomore year saying, can I do this? Like, am I an engineer? I don't feel like one. It wasn't really until junior year where I started getting the hands-on experience. Um, but I, I think the way to also get through that is confide in your peers. Everyone is feeling the same same way. You probably turn to the person next to you and they're going through it, you know? Um, so really just know that everyone's kind of in the same boat there and um, kind of just have to stick it out. And once you do, oh, that reward is so satisfying, knowing that you got through the degree. And I promise everyone, you will feel like a physicist. You will feel like an engineer. You will feel like it once you're done. I have a very different answer. I think it's going to be slow, <laughs> but I think it's changing. So I think having more like women um, at higher position will slowly like 
if you go into university and you see no women mm -hmm. and all the people you see, all the postdocs, all the lecturers, all the professors are all this homogeneous block and you don't look like them, it's mm -hmm. difficult. But things are changing and there's more and more people with like, a varied kind of background and varied kind of experience getting to such positions. And that's also going to make it easier. And not just because they are there, but also because them being there makes it more difficult for the others to make comments uh, in public. Because it used to be common to say that, oh, you're a woman in engineering, really? And I think that's not common anymore. So not getting this kind of comments will slowly make it easier for you to feel like you belong. Um, and not going through, yeah, I mean, it's, it's always small things, right? It's never something obvious like, oh yeah, women should not be here. No, it's more like, oh really, you're a woman here. And even though it's not a direct like, um, aggression about you shouldn't be here, it still feels a bit like, oh, maybe I don't belong. But I think just having more of us around and being there and making sure that these comments are not considered okay, mm -hmm. that's already going to make it easier for people from undergrads to go to masters and choose to stay in this field. Um, I, I think it would also help if there was more encouragement. I think a lot of women, like they take a physics class because it's like required for their degree program or whatever. But if they did well in it and their teacher pulled themselves like, hey, you're really good at this. Like maybe consider taking physics too. It has these kinds of applications. It will look good on these, like give them reasons and, and how it will impact their trajectory and just let them know that it's an option and that they're encouraged to do it and let them make their own choices. But I feel like a lot of women don't necessarily, and not just like women, but like everyone in physics introductory classes don't feel like they necessarily belong. And just having that extra nudge can make a big difference, especially for people who are more hesitant or don't feel like they fit in. And also maybe highlighting other physicists than Marie Curie, because um, <laughs> she was amazing, but let's be realistic. We're not all going to be her. Um, so having other kind of, of models that are maybe um, amazing to us, but there and alive and do exist uh, would be something helpful because we all know physicists that are from the like recent time, most of them men. Um, but there's very few women we can name. If you go and ask people, usually there's one name that comes up and that, that's going to be it. Um, so maybe, maybe highlighting more profiles and being aware that there is these amazing women today that are doing good for science and that are making it happen. That would maybe motivate you to stay, right? That there is, there's a possibility for somebody like you, I, and most people around in the room to actually become a physicist. Yeah, I think another important message to spread is that like you can get better at things too if you work at them. So like, um, you know, people don't have like an inherent mathematical ability, in my opinion. Like, you know, um, I train myself like to do you know do math problems quickly and correctly. Um, yeah, and I, I think. That could really help. And I definitely saw this at like in college with like people who were from like worse high schools. Um, they didn't do very well for the first like one to two years of college. And by the end, like they were like crushing it. So um, attend more panels, listen to people's stories and hear, you know, they're going through like I mentioned before, everyone's going through the same thing, but even maybe seek advice from professors or just networking events um, to hear their story and hear, I'm sure they'll have a very similar story and um, they'll tell you to stick through it. Thank you very much. And on that note, I'd like to thank all of our panelists and remind everyone that everyone will be around to speak after all companies are actively hiring. Please talk to us, learn more. Um, thank you to Phil, Missy, Kenna, um, Qubit, Jilla, Nist. I think this is Fantastic. And I think one of the main takeaways is we need to have more panels and more discussions to really push the needle. So thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thank you.